Hamita aqui a pior, assim, quando eu achei na pesquisa, pia, a que e os que eu achei a capia, o chanque e o tamo de mie, a da macota, pejiu da fisica, a pimocote, remata, hanyak, a wakpeto a remata, a ina remata, a um, Hello, my relatives. It's with a good heart that I greet all of you with a handshake today. I'm sorry for the glare off my face as, as we are here post thunderstorms. Um, I, um, in English, my name is Autumn Cavender Wilson. In Dakota, my name is Uchang Tawi, or Woman of the Greatest Star. I'm Wachbetu in Dakota from, um, from what is currently known as Southwestern Minnesota. My community is Pijbutazizik um, Api Mokote, or the land where they dig for the yellow medicine. Um, the, um, so Upper Sioux community is a really, really tiny little reservation out here in the southwest corner, and so um, you know that's that's where we're broadcasting from today. Um, I am a wife, I am a mother, and um, I'm a midwife. Um, and I've been doing birth work um, since I was 17 years old, uh, which is now weird to say that I've been doing that for over a decade. I feel very old saying that, uh, which is kind of hilarious. Um, and uh yeah i um i gave birth to um to my son my i have one child um and my son dacian um was born here in my community in the in our first plant our community's first planned home birth in um in almost half a century um that home birth and um in midwifery care particularly was something that was very much stolen from our people um through the processes of colonization um and uh the western medicalization of indigenous reservations and healthcare um over the last um certainly over the last half a century but definitely over the last even 150 years as indian agent doctors came in and slowly began to take away um, our faith and our faith in and the ability to practice um, of our traditional um, traditional medicine keepers. Um, and so for me, doing birth work, um, doing midwifery work in particularly, is a really, really important part of the decolonization process and how we choose to bring our babies into this world, um, in my opinion, really, really matters. Um, not just from a spiritual perspective, not just from a ceremonial perspective, um, not just even from like a social perspective, but very much from a revolutionary decolonization stance. Um, if we ever hope to have a better future for our our children, it very much matters how we bring them into this world, who touches them first, under what circumstances, and by whose authority. Um, frequently, as Indigenous women in particular in, in dominant Western systems, including the medical system, we find that our bodily autonomy is systematically taken from us on a repeated basis. And um, retaking that is insanely important. Um, not just for our own individual well-beings, but also for our collective autonomy. Um, when that becomes normative, when that becomes the, the thing that we normally engage in is having autonomy and true informed choice over our bodies and over the procedures that happen to us and how we choose to engage with medicine, it, that inherently strengthens our entire nations. <laughs> Margaret Olin Hoffman David Sauza, Tuega Utan Islan, Betsikte Utana Islan, Tua Aloga Utan Sadansalet, Inkrich Leso, Danaka Hedo Horeke E. I'm learning my language. Um, hi everyone, I'm Margaret. I'm from the interior region of Alaska, a place on the Yukon River between the two bluffs, Tua Aloga, and I now live and work on Denina land. Um, Mouth of the Needlefish, um, also known as Anchorage, our big city here in Alaska. I live here with my partner EJ and our four children who are ages 10, 9, 7, and 7 months. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today, um, joining in this conversation and sharing a little bit about what I've been learning along the way uh, in my work as a midwife and in parenting and in being a human being. I became a midwife uh, two years ago. Before that, I was working in tribal community health for about 12 years. And through that work and also through, you know, the experiences of becoming a parent and experiencing my first birth and having a midwife, 
I really found that um, it was such an important time for healing, for generational healing. And in my work in you know, wellness and prevention, I realized that's really where I wanna be at the time uh, when somebody is pregnant, um, just the impact that the care that they take for themselves and the way that they're cared for during that time um, has on generations, on their healing of their ancestors that came before us and yet to come um, was just so profound. And that's why I chose to uh, work in midwifery. And there are lots of different you know, pathways to midwifery for me. Um, I wanted to work within our tribal health system where most of our people are receiving care right now. And so um, I chose the nurse midwifery pathway, even though the way that I would, you know, dream of practicing is for home birth. Um, right now, most of our people here are birthing in the hospital and living here in Anchorage, um, there's also a lot of people that come in from rural Alaska to give birth for whatever reasons. And uh, that was where, you know, I wanted to be working as a midwife. There aren't any other Alaska Native midwives right now. Um, I know of some that are on their way, hopefully, and I'm so excited for us to, you know, keep growing in numbers and in areas that we're able to reach and communities served. Um, I don't know what else for an intro right now. <clears throat> so I also am a mother. Um, I just had a baby seven months ago and part of my sharing today was going to be around some of my learnings through that experience um, with first moments. And so she's seven months. I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old. And two were born at home. One was born at a birth center and one was born in the hospital because she was premature. And I've been married going on 13 years. And um, yeah, that's, that's me for right now. The theme for today I just want to share um, was inspired by um, seeing some insanely adorable pictures of Tala, Margaret's, Margaret's newest, um, you know, learning new, just loving food and seeing the foods that were being chosen for her. And then also just a comment that was put out there of, you know, what are the first words that you want your baby to hear? And then, you know, seeing just some of the responses of people that were, were making those connections of, you know, not only did they want their child to, to hear a, a welcome, a blessing, a prayer, a something that, that, you know, welcomed them, um, you know, into this other realm, but that also it was deeply connected to language revitalization and and also for a lot of people of even figuring out what those those words should be or what you know how to how to find um, the words and the language that they want to give to their child uh, it is uh, the, those all these first moments are first gifts you know they are they are things that are are going to be um, setting the stage for all of the, the future moments in life and so now what we want to do is we're just going to be be going from um, and and just discussing these first moments and so we're going to be doing that by having each of these mothers just share some of the intention that went into um, you know dreaming and thinking and preparing um, and and also just sharing about the different you know very different from a, a Dakota mother and an Alaska Native mother, the foods that were chosen and and how those were introduced, and um, and just also you know be be speaking about how 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 birth and language and and foods and 
first breaths and first moments are, are also completely intertwined. Um, so I think at this point, uh, Autumn is going to begin and just share some of her story on her journey with her son. And Rhonda, feel free to cut me off because you know I can just ramble for a really long time. So feel free to like mute me if I'm over if I'm over budget. Um, so I before I, I talk about myself with my son um, and and me and my husband's journey with my son, one of the first things I want to talk about is the concept of of original instruction. Um, we as Indigenous people, when we were placed on our lands at the beginning of the, at the beginning of humanly relevant time. We were given instructions as to how we were supposed to live, how we were supposed to conduct ourselves. Um, frequently, there were particular animals, particular plants that took responsibility for our well being. Um, they are our original teachers and they are our beings and collective spirits that we as nations have entered into agreement with, right? And that those agreements are inherently important. Um, and they continue to be important even within the context of colonization, even within the, con within the context of genocide, and even within the context of modernity, um, which is like something that we all really have to wrap our minds around, right? Um, and what's, um, you know, before I was a midwife or while I was going through birth work training, um, I was primarily a youth worker. I did a lot of, um, you know, running youth and youth um, language and culture camp. And what I found is that, um, you know, we as Dakota people, we're buffalo people, right? We're, we're a people who is inherently linked with bison. And the vast majority of our children have actually never seen one up close, right? And so what does that mean? That for these children, that they haven't had an established relationship with a, with a particular spirit being, with a particular physical entity that our whole nation entered into an agreement with at the beginning of time, right? So within these contexts of like original instructions, how this kind of translates then um, is, is to a practical level, right? How do we begin to, to bring back and reinstill original instruction in our children? And it begins I, ideally preconceptionally, but it certainly, if not, begins during, during pregnancy and birth. And so um, we all have, all of us individually as Indigenous nations have individual instructions on what are the things we are supposed to do to prepare for the arrival of a child. Right, what are the things our family is supposed to put together? What are the things that we as individuals are supposed to put together? What are the ceremonies that we're supposed to conduct to, to begin to welcome this being into this world? And so for us as Dakota people, there's four items that we are supposed to have in place upon baby's arrival here. Um, the first one is a bonnet or a head covering. The second one is a cradle board. The third is a pair of moccasins for that child. And then the fourth is a what, what's called a chakwao juha or um, a bag in which to put baby's umbilical cord. Okay. Each of these items holds a crazy amount of spiritual, cosmological, astrological significance, right? The purpose is to welcome this new person, this new spirit, this ancestor into this world and to remind them in very, very concrete ways what exactly their relationship with the rest of creation is. The Chakbao Juha, the umbilical cord bag, is directly related to different constellations, which in turn have stories that accompany them, which in turn have sacred holy sites that accompany those. And so you're directly rooting baby back to land and back to stars, right? Um, cradle boards are definitely to, like, you know, not just to, you know, ideas about posture, um, but also how babies are raised, you know, training them to be observant right? Training them to be able to see the whole world around them. We also know now um, through different neurological studies that they do with babies that having your kid in a stroller looking at everyone's knees is not the most ideal place for their brain development. Babies are designed to look at faces. Babies are designed to look and watch human interaction at eye level, right? Cradle boards were all about that. Most, um, most traditional baby wearing technologies were about bringing small children up to our eye level so that they could learn the social interaction that accompanies those things, right? Um, moccasins, of like moccasins for us are always a really major, um, major part of any life transition. Um, one of the key aspects, both of infant moccasins and of moccasins given to the dead, are that the bottoms are decorated either with quill work or with beadwork. 
Um, it's the sign of love that you would spend that much time beating or quilling the bottom of somebody's moccasin, something that theoretically no one's going to see. But also with babies, this idea that as they walk, as they learn to walk, they will wear off those designs on the bottoms of those moccasins. And it's a mark of their maturity. It's a mark of moving forward, that you would be able to walk and, and wear those designs away. Um, and then the fourth, um, as the bonnet, you know, we all, um, all of us have different stories or beliefs about that soft spot, that top fontanelle on baby's head and their ability to travel, right? Um, that their, their spirit can leave their bodies and travel around and, and hopefully come back, right? Um, but placing that protective covering over their heads also means that nothing else can get in, right? So it's about protecting baby's head. Obviously in cold weather climates like Minnesota, it also serves like the dual purpose of keeping our kids' heads warm. Um, but it, it's important spiritual ideas that we begin passing to our children before they can talk, before we can even adequately explain to them what it means, right? They become rooted within this world. Um, and so in addition to these like four basic items, <clears throat> I'm gonna see if I can share my screen really quick here. Do do right? There are new souls in new bodies come into this world. And so what you do in order to influence this person's character is you surround them with things that, um, that you want to rub off on them, right? You want these particular items and the, and the essence and the spirit of those things to imbibe their spirits, to imbibe their souls with, with lessons and with teachings. And so for our son, it was really important. Both my husband and I play traditional lacrosse. So you'll see a lacrosse stick there. Um, it was really important for us, you know, for not just um, not just the physical aspect of it, because it's also a war game, and we are a warrior people. Um, obviously, the cradle board, you see the moccasins there. Um, what you don't see in there, because we thought people might freak people out, was a knife. <laughs> um, that knife skills were something that was really important for our people to have, and so we had a little tiny bitty knife that we would hang off of the cradle board. But also, we've been extremely conscientious, even with his stuffed animals, right? bison, wolves. These are our primary teachers of how we organize our lives, how we organize our societies, where our hunting comes from, um, how, we treat, how we treat women, how we treat children, um, what our hunting strategies are, what our war strategies are, where we get our song, where we get our music, all of those things. Um, obviously the deer hide um, in the, like the fawn skin and then, um, and then the buffalo hide underneath that. It's all about infusing this child with the um, with the relationships that we want them to have, right? And so these were items that we had prepped um, prior, prior to his birth. Um, so what I'll also say, kind of like moving on then now, we've, we've talked about like pregnancy and so moving on to those first moments, you know, during my, our, my labor with my son, um, you know, my husband set up an altar and, you know, was really, really involved with the whole pregnancy and then also with the birth. And so, um, and, and, I hope Margaret will speak more to this, but it was really important to us that, um, that it be Dakota hands to be the first to touch our child, right? To have it not be my midwife, who's extremely wonderful and who I love very, very much, but who's a, who's a non-native woman. Um, it was important for us to have the first hands that touch my son this side of this world um, be Dakota hands, right? As an important part of our, of our sovereignty. Um, and so it was my husband who caught my son, um, and nobody else touched him, really, for the first hour or two that he was born. Um, it, was only, it was only the two of us. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into, like, placenta ceremonies. But in that first moment, it's important, and I, I say this as a language revitalization activist, and so, you know, please understand that that is the lens that I'm coming at this with. But if we hold that our children were with our ancestors before their birth. If we hold that they are stars, their souls are stars that we have prayed into this world. If we hold that our, they were sent by our ancestors, it does not make any sense that English was the language they spoke on that other side. It makes sense that our indigenous languages, in my case, Dakota, in your case, whatever nation you're from, it makes sense that that is the language that your baby knows, right? They already know it because that is the language their ancestors have been speaking to them 
speaking to them for their entire cosmological, theological, spiritual existence up to this point. So it makes sense to welcome them within that language, even if it's only a couple words, even if you only know one word, that is enough in that moment. And so there's, you know, as we've kind of talked about on Facebook, there's, there's a whole host of things, you know, variations on welcome, variations on recognizing this person as a relative, right? Um, you know, so for me, it was really important that like when I looked at him, I, you know, when I knew who he was, it was important for me to call him son, Shang-Chi, right away. So he knew not only who he was to me, but who I was to him, right? Teaching them relationships right away. Um, another one that I, I've used occasionally, particularly when I'm working with like my non-native clients, is um, I just use an acknowledgement in Dakota Oha, right? This acknowledgement that you've arrived, right? Um, not anything more than that necessarily. Like even those little tiny words are important, right? And they matter. If for no other reason, even if you don't buy all of the other like cosmological, theological stuff, it matters because we are imprinting on ourselves the importance of speaking our language to our children, right? In that first moment, we are also being reformed as parents. And so speaking that language to that child is an important foundational moment for us as well as them. Um, so, um, Going back to the idea of original instructions, oh, hi, um, you know, and, and talking about different particular beings that have taken responsibility for our collective well-being as nations, again, for us, this is bison. This is, we are a buffalo people, that we are in agreement with the bison, that they have agreed to care for us in this life. Um, so as consequence, our first food ceremony that we have with our children is with bison meat. Um, as Native folks, we understand the, the idea of reciprocity and relationship. Um, we understand that partaking of um, like the flesh of a particular being, be it plant or animal, is, in, is generating that reciprocity. It's taking that into ourselves, transmuting that item, that being, that spirit into our own bodies so that we now have responsibility for that relationship as well. So, um, and this is where like modern like modern science, modern best practice, modern knowledge meets traditional ceremony, right? We forget that our people were scientists. Our people were amazing observational scientists and they of course use the best available po possible information as they made decisions. Um, whereas a long time ago, we may have done first food bison ceremonies like the day of a birth. Now we can wait. Now we can do, you know, colostrum. Now we can do breast milk first and hold off on those first ceremonies, not because they're not important, but because we know that this first food is, is more important than anything else for their particular digestive system, right? This is how they work, this is how they function, and it's never too late to do those ceremonies to cement the relationships with whatever that being is. Right, this is clearly my son. This is actually how I still eat meat off of the bone. Um, just all in there. Um, and that it's in, you know, it, it's just one of those things that we, we understand that, that medicine um, is, is still valid, is still real, even if you wait six months after, after exclusively breastfeeding to feed that baby. I think that's it for the moment for me. All right, I meant to have this in the background when I was introducing myself to ground myself and just um, kind of locate myself a little bit where I'm coming from. Um, so I had said I'm from um, Pla Aloga. It's uh, the place between the two bluffs. It's this picture up here on the left. Um, Ruby is a village on the Yukon River. That's where my family comes from. And I was introducing my matrilineal line. Um, my mom, Quetzaltuna, and my Sitsu, uh, Nislohutno. And um, this picture up here in the middle is my mom's great grandma. So my great great grandma, uh, Nislohutno, as well. And then over here um, on the right is a picture of like a few photos kind of put together 
as I was thinking about like reflecting on um, how, you know, as a childbearing person, when we're pregnant, we are connected to um, our future ancestors, you know, like two generations ahead of us. And how when we were forming ourselves, you know, we're connected to our ancestor two generations um, back from us. And, you know, a big part of my learning and healing in my adulthood has been around, you know, intergenerational healing and realizing, you know, I don't have control of, you know, what happened to my parents and grandparents and, you know, what they do. But for myself, I knew I had to heal myself so that this, you know, intergenerational trauma does not continue to affect my kids. Um, and Grandma Rita Bloomingstein, who's a tribal doctor and traditional midwife, one of her biggest um, impacts on me and, you know, some of her teaching. Um, Niflo Hutno is um, the grandma here in the middle. She's my great-great-grandma. Her granddaughter, um, my Sitsu Lorraine, is on here too. She's also named Niflo Hutno. And then I named... Um, our first daughter um, down here in the corner, um, or next to the baby in the corner, um, so Nisla Hutno. Um, so these are some pictures um, from the last couple of years, um, as I was just thinking about, you know, this recent birth story and kind of some of the preparation, you know, before she came. Um, the last few years, you know, as I was in midwifery school and also becoming connected with our indigenous midwifery group. So part of my learning in, in becoming a midwife is also trying to remember, you know, some of our ceremonies that we've lost through colonization. I was going to share a little bit about Tala's story, our seven-month-old. So in, in these gatherings with where we were meeting other, you know, traditional birth workers. I met Patricia Gonzalez, who's here on the Zoom call, I believe. And at our very first meeting, she told me that we have another baby on the way. And this was like in 2015, I think. And um, at that time, I was in midwifery school and not planning another baby at that time. But, you know, throughout the years that we were meeting together, you know, this had been, you know, being mentioned. And finally last year, um, she started making our, our way to us. Also during that time, um, our daughter, Nislo Hutno, um, she's been coming with me to our midwifery gatherings and has really, you know, like been identifying herself as a midwife. And so, you know, me and her, all her aunties, many of whom are here on the call, are nurturing, you know, that in her as well. And when I became uh, pregnant with Tala, she said that she wanted to be the one to catch her. Um, and so this is, you know, these a couple of pictures um, up here on the left are some pictures of her throughout the years as she's learning more about midwifery and identifying with it more and more. Some other ways um, that we prepared, you know, during this pregnancy and birth were with some of our plant relatives. So there's just a couple of pictures of one that I'm sure many of you identify, you know, recognize, yarrow. Um, we use that for our um, first bath after birth and baby's first bath. Um, for fortifying and healing from birth. And the plant to the left is the pineapple weed, which is um, one of our traditional medicines for moms and babies. Um, it's given in tea, you know, after birth, during labor, after birth. The tea can be used, um, you know, when babies are, you know, just need some extra comfort or, you know, 
some calming down for their tummy. Like they say, when babies are colicky, um, you can use some chamomile tea. I um, like to infuse it in oil and just olive oil and then use it as a body oil or massage oil. So um, I use it on my body. Um, and since Tala was born, I use it on her body, you know, after her baths. Um, it's just really calming and soothing. Um, other ways for preparing, you know, during this pregnancy um, and for birth, we're gathering with, you know, um, other, um, you know, close sisters around me. That's the um, picture down in the middle. Um, just, um, you know, connecting with my circle of support in that way was really the only thing that I felt like I needed during this pregnancy. This was my fourth time going through it. And the main thing that I um, was seeking was just, you know, being connected with that circle of support and those sisters around me. So we had a really beautiful gathering, um, you know, a couple weeks before she came. And then this picture down here on the right, that's, um, the, you know, when I was in labor. She, and she came right at 40 weeks, which really surprised me. All my other, you know, my two babies that were born full term were almost 42 weeks. And then Manu right here, she was our 34-weeker, the one that was born in the hospital. So I guess I'm just mentioning those things, like just mentioning a few of the ways um, that we've prepared and kind of what led up to Tala's birth in her first moments. And, you know, as I reflect on her story, just, you know, how smoothly things went, um, you know, we could say, um, you know, it just went that way. But I really feel that these different ways that we were able to connect and prepare um, helped a lot with the way that her birth went. Um, these are some pictures from her birth. The night before um, she was born, my brother was in town and we were celebrating, we were sharing um, his, some moose meat from his first moose that he and celebrating that. And so that night, you know, before my labor started, we had a big family dinner and we had stayed up till midnight help, helping him package and put away his moose meat. And we were singing Danaka songs, um, you know, just really happy and all together as a family. And as we were sharing songs, um, one of Manu's favorite songs that we learned, one of our midwifery gatherings is the Strong Woman song that was shared with us. And she wanted to sing that, so we started singing that song. And that song, um, people take turns leading the round. And so we were just drumming and singing and, and, waiting, and waiting for you know, the next person to jump in and lead the round. And we were doing that for like half an hour or so. And everybody at my house, um, my sister and her family, my brother and his family, both of my parents, um, my, my mother-in-law, whose first language is Tagalog, you know, each took a turn, you know, leading that song. And so we were all singing it and it would just kind of got into like a, like a, like a trance almost. Um, anyway, just went to bed, like feeling really good that night. And the next morning, um, oh, and also this Daniga, this moose, um, had been coming around our house with her two babies and like hanging out around the house. Um, they were around in the neighborhood, you know, that night we had the dinner and that night they came and slept in our backyard. Um, and then the next morning when I woke up is when I woke up to my water breaking, um, which is very dramatic. That hadn't happened in any of my other labors. I wasn't having contractions yet. But I woke up and I, you know, I stood up and then just like this dramatic gush of water was coming out. And um, 
those Daniga were still hanging around, you know, our house, you know, all that day, kind of, I don't know, it, hanging out with us, um, you know, kind, kind of waiting for a baby to be born. Um, and then later on, on that night, my contraction started and we just had a really, you know, smooth and calm and quiet and, and beautiful birth. And Manu was there. She um, was observing the work that the other midwives were doing in my home. And she saw that they were recording. And so she got her own notepad and started taking notes too. Um, she would, like when I was laying down, you know, upstairs in my room, um, she'd come in and like, you know, kind of cuddle next to me. It was all quiet. I was laying down, you know, trying to, you know, breathe through my contractions and um, she'd be like, how are you doing, mom? Um, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? And um, just, just, I don't know. It was just like exactly, you know, what I needed. <laughs> um, and she just knew how to come in and check in on me, you know, in that way. And later on, I saw in her notes, you know, that she was writing things down and, and, and keeping her birth log too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, her labor, you know, Tala's labor was, it was pretty um, calm. You know, I wasn't having contractions for a long time. They were very, very mild, you know, when they started. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, then they started. Um, and I got in the tub and, you know, not very um, much longer, you know, later she was born. And Manu, um, I was the first, I, I wanted, um, um, I had talked with my midwives ahead of time, you know, explaining that I didn't want anybody else touching kind of what Autumn was talking about. I really wanted her first touch to be from us, from her family. And so I was the one that, you know, was the first to touch her as her head was coming out. And then once her head was born, then Manu caught the rest of her body um, in the water. So, you know, that first touch was, you know, by me and her older sister. And that was really important to me. Um, and it may seem like such a small thing. Um, and it's something that we can do no matter where we're birthing. You know, I work in the, the where, where I work in birth is in the hospital. And, you know, we may not be able to have a birth like this, in, you know, in the, these pictures, but we can still bring that, you know, ceremony and those um, significant things with us into the hospital too. Um, and I try to ask, you know, people when I'm meeting with them, questions like that, what are the, you know, try to envision, you know, what are the first um, sounds you want your baby to hear? What language do you want them to hear first? Um, what do you want them to feel first and taste first? You know, kind of engaging those senses and, and envisioning um, what, you, they want them to, their first um, experiences to be. And then, um, and then also thinking about first words, um, you know, we're learning our language again, and um, I may not have, you know, all the words that I want to say to her in Danaka, but I can say, you know, welcome baby, you know, and I can say, I love you baby. So those were the words that I said to her when she was born. Um, and um, just over and over again, you know, when she was born, um, those were the first words that, that she heard. And we had the, one of the Facebook posts that Rhonda was talking about was, um, I was just reaching out, trying to learn in our different Alaska Native languages, there's you know many different languages spoken here. Um, what are some of the first words that people want their babies to hear in their languages? So we got a list of you know how to say "I love you, baby" in almost all of our different Alaska Native languages. 
um, that we're printing on little cards to share with families through our Alaska Native Birth Workers um, community. So yeah, first, first words, you know, first sounds, first smells. Um, I really wanted to be smelling sweet grass, and so we were burning sweet grass. And one of the teachings that an elder had um, shared with me before about sweet grass, when I was pregnant with Manu, he shared this with me, um, and he said. You know, burn sweet, sweet grass during your labor and burn it, you know, those first days at your home with baby. Um, and then later on, you know, when baby needs some comforting, you know, burn sweet grass again and they'll remember those first precious moments with you and be comforted, you know, remembering that time with you. Um, so first words, first sounds, you know, the drumming, the language, the songs, um, first smells, first touch, um, and then first foods. I didn't quite um, finish getting some pictures together with that, but thinking about how when we are growing a baby inside of us, you know, the foods that we eat, those tastes go into the amniotic fluid that the baby is swallowing, um, you know, while we're pregnant with them. So they're getting exposed to our foods, um, you know, prenatally. So what foods do you want them to be um, tasting first? Like what kinds of taste do you want them to develop, um, you know, their preferences for? So traditional foods, um, you know, prenatally for me are really important. Um, whatever we have access to, we may not have access to all the traditional foods that we want, but you know, we do our best and um, try to prime our baby's taste buds, you know, for those traditional foods. <clears throat> and then through our breast milk too, so what we're, if we think about, you know, the foods that we're eating and how that's getting into our breast milk and so our babies are developing a taste for our traditional foods through our breast milk too. Um, and then their first, you know, solid foods. For all of my babies, it was really important that their first foods be, you know, our traditional foods. And actually with my 10 year old, um, when he was a baby, when he was like five months or so, we were visiting my grandma and Galena and my auntie, you know, was living with her, caring for her. And she, you know, noticed that my baby was teething and me, I wasn't quite recognizing those signs yet. It was my first baby. And so she took our frozen um, fish strip out of the freezer and gave it to me to give to him. And um, so that was, you know, for his teething, but um, also his first, you know, taste of solid food was a king salmon strip. And I'm just so grateful that she did that. And, um, and so it was really important, you know, for me for their first taste of foods to be traditional food. So that was his first food. Manu's first food was, you know, a salmon strip. And then my third, um, his babies, his first food was a was dried moose meat. Um, and then Tala's first um, solid foods was also, you know, sucking on it on a dried salmon strip. <clears throat> and in thinking about, you know, places where we're birthing now, I had mentioned, you know, a lot of Alaska Native people live in Anchorage now, which is kind of our, you know, main city in Alaska. And we're from all over the state. I'm from, you know, my family's from the interior um, and we're living here in South Central Alaska now. Um, so we may not be able to be, and, and also, you know, rural women that have to come into, or, you know, have to come into Anchorage for birth 
um, you know, one of my big concerns, and again, a reason why I went into midwifery is how, you know, birth is being displaced from the community. We're birthing our babies, you know, not on our lands as much anymore. Um, so when we are exposing them to our traditional foods, which come from our lands, you know, we're tying them to the, you know, our land that way. When we say these first words to them in our languages, um, which are based, you know, they develop, you know, are based on the land that we come from, you know, they're tied to, you know, our ancestral homelands in that way too. Oh, here's a few more pictures. I didn't finish putting them nice on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's okay. Um, those are just some of those first foods I was talking about, including breast milk. And just really appreciating, you know, yeah, the ways that it, it ties our babies to the land, even we, when we can't always be on our ancestral homelands. Can I just say one more thing about first first words too? Um, I was left because I was thinking about this earlier and preparing for this presentation and trying to figure out like what my son's first words were. And um, it wasn't Ina or Ate or um, or mother or father in our language. It was actually Nini, which is breast milk, like breast milk, you know, the the indication for nurse. And and I think that that um, I think that's one hilarious and was like a massive blow to my ego, which I totally deserved. <laughs> um, but it also like shows um, very much like what's important for our people and and no matter where we go across Indian country um, and across like indigenous nations across the world, food is crazy important. We all have amazing traditions and rules and protocols around the harvesting, planting, preparing, gifting, receiving, eating, post eating of food. Um, and for us all to be reminded of that with our children as well, what we feed them is important. And also, they love it. <laughs> that like eating as a baby, and really it should be as an adult too, eating should always be a full body experience. And they just haven't had the socialization to teach them that it shouldn't be yet. And the amount of like dedication that all of our children have to, to nursing, I think it's a real testament to the, to the power of that first food. Um, and um, and following that, you know, and I've 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 talked to Cammy Goldhammer about this as well, but I, and I think it's important just to bring up really quick right now is that because our peoples have been so colonized and so repressed for so long, um, there can be a lot of social stigma around nursing and around breastfeeding within our communities. Um, you know, not only doing it in the first place, but for how long <laughs> you breastfeed your child, um, and um, and what I want to say is that some of the some of the ways in which that um, that prejudice happens or that that um, that colonization shows up is in, is pretty insidious. Um, I was once told that um, you shouldn't exclusively breastfeed a baby because water is holy. Water is our first medicine, and to deprive a baby of water is antithetical to what it means to be indigenous. And so babies should be given just plain water all the time. Obviously, we know that's not true, right? And so what I would warn, like for a lot of folks too, is that watch the ways in which colonized ideas around not just nursing, but like child rearing in general, around pregnancy, around birth, around conception, watch the ways in which colonized thinking masquerades as traditional teachings or how things have been, have, have always been done, at least in living memory within our communities. Because the more we dig, the more we find out that that isn't true. Um, the more elders I've talked to, the more research I've done, our children were sometimes breastfed up until age seven. The idea that we wouldn't nurse our children late into their lives is, is ridiculous. The idea that we wouldn't exclusively nurse our babies it's ridiculous, right? But these are contemporary colonized teachings that are masquerading as tradition. And that's something that we all need to be consciously aware of as we move forward with anything with parenting. Um, and just be, and you know, being protective of ourselves and of our children too. 
right? Um, there's no reason for any of us to be shamed for our parenting choices. <laughs> we're all making the best decisions we can under the circumstances that we're in. And um, it's, it's not okay for anyone to, to shame those decisions, whatever they are. I wanted to just say also that there are some aspects that just are not in our control. Like for example, um, you know, being the first person to touch your baby, if the safest way for your baby to be born is an abdominal birth, um, that, you know, there's, we can also just take these moments and re-gift them and, you know, and, and preserve all of the ways that we can. And so I want us to also just, you know, remember that, um, that, that all of these moments all help craft who our children are, are going to be and, and that we are thankfully being provided with new opportunities um, steadily and, and that we need to seize them. You know, we need, it, we need to prioritize them. And, you know, I personally, I'm, I'm a mother of a, a 20 year old and, you know, there's new moments as our, our relationship changes and you know when the time comes for her to birth and where our relationship will shift again and so you know I, I wanted to just say that that um, you know sometimes there can be griefs that there were you know just different pieces um, that that we we weren't able to offer or that we we didn't have words and other people were speaking or just any of those those feelings and to, that it's okay to 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 grieve those and then be like, okay, what is this gift that I can offer my child now? And, and to move forward with that. So at this point, my thoughts are that I would love to just, uh, I'm going to change the setting so that um, if you are wanting um, to unmute yourself, that you now will be able to. And I'd love to just, um, open up to some questions and sometimes you know because people don't know if they're someone else is gonna go so just take a breath and then it's okay just um, unmute yourself and go ahead and share or ask and then um, we'll move forward so I'll go ahead and ask a question then um, I would love to just hear for other people that are on the call, um, are there other traditional foods that you've thought about, um, you know, sharing with your children or that you did share with your children that you would like to share? Just um, about what you were just saying about different types of birth. Um, you know, even in, you know, the operating room, if a baby's born in there, it's still totally feasible to ask, you know, coordinate, you know, if it's not an emergent, you know, situation, um, you can ask for the room to be quiet, you know, when baby comes out and have, um, you know, you yourself, or if you have a birth partner with you, be the first voice that baby hears still. I've been in, um, you know, the operating room um, where we were, we were singing, you know, and those were the baby's first sounds, even though it was like a very medical environment, um, you know, we can still, you know, have some um, saying that for, um, you know, even like the first sound, sound that we want baby to hear, um, or if we're not able to do that, like there's, there's lots of ways to kind of reclaim those first moments um, in birth and um, with your with our newborns. Um, even if we're not able to like, you know, have all the things that we want, or maybe we didn't know at the time, we can still do things now. You know, we're always learning. Um, and it doesn't mean um, that we can't do them now. You know, and Margaret, like, would you also say, um, I, I definitely experienced this that um, so maybe it's not a song maybe it's not words maybe it's that you want to hear the heartbeat of the drum and that's what you want or um, you want the the rattle uh, but that it also does this amazing thing of helping everyone in the room who just recognize that something 
you know, really enchanting and miraculous and maybe that, that made their heart stop or maybe that, you know, brought fear into their body, but it helps everyone take a moment and take a deep breath and remember that this is, this is a moment, that this is a, a ceremony that's happening. And so I really strongly encourage, um, for people and 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 maybe they're the people that are on the edges and that it often helps the room pause the tasks that they need to do of you know of of the the activity that's around um and then to just be grounded in this in the sound and um often you know the, the baby will pause and be stop and and look uh rather than you know maybe they had started crying and now they're able to just uh you know be back in their body or maybe it is the care provider you know is it stops and is thinking like oh, okay do i need to do this right now or is this a really important moment um, and so it really can shift the energy of a room and it is a really powerful tool at any, any place, any birth for, for all of the people and all the energies in the space. And so think about that song, think about those people who can begin and, you know, bring in the, that, that heartbeat. Um, and they are, they are the protectors and often that is you know, a father role or, or someone like that who um, is able to gift that song. And um, it can be a, a, a really important thing um, to just ground everyone. Yep, that story, um, you know, that I was just mentioning that I was singing in the OR with the mom, um, I heard back afterwards, you know, from the surgeons, how that just helped them too, like, you know, exactly what you were just saying, like connect with the sacredness in this moment for that family and, you know, be all the more, you know, respectful during that time. And um, it helped, you know, calm them too as they were doing their work. Um, so you're right, you know, it's um, so important for the families, but it just, it helps the whole, the vibe of the whole room, like all the, whoever else is in there, you know, too. In other stories, you know, there was a family where, you know, in our prenatal appointment, I had asked that question, you know, what are the first words that you want to say to your baby or that you want your baby to hear and who do you want to say them? And so they were able to think about that in, and then during their birth, you know, have that moment to be you know, they made a plan with the team, and I was there at the midwife um, at that birth, but they were able to, we were able to make a plan with everybody else that was in the room, the nurses, that they were wanting it to be quiet when baby was born, and for them to be the first voices um, that they wanted their baby to hear. And, you know, later on, I heard back from that family, like how special that was for them. Um, it's really not a hard thing to do, you know, wherever you're giving birth, um, even if things are kind of hectic, um, you can still afford, you know, like a, a moment um, and work that out with, you know, whoever's attending the birth. Mm -hmm. Abra, would you like to share what you were typing? Oh, yeah, I could share. Hi. Hi. Um... So I, I, hi everyone, I'm just on the, I, I don't have my video going, but so it's similar to what Margaret was sharing about dry fish. We have akikak, which is the a part of the flipper of the bowhead whale, and um, it's frozen and raw, but it's nice thin strips that baby can chew on while they're teething. So that's a really common first food and um, also dry meat. and. But in the Arctic, in Alaska, where I'm from, um, it's caribou, so dried caribou meat. And that's, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thanks, thanks so much for what everyone has shared. Would anyone else like to share or have any questions? I do just want to make sure that we have, have time for people to ask um, and share if they would like.
I'll share a small bit. Um, this is Kiona. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, and my kids are in the background, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, one thing that I think is important when it comes to giving birth in general, but also like as a multicultural person, I am Native American, Mexican, and African American. And so I have a really, growing up, hang on, baby. Come here. Growing up, I've had a really hard time figuring out where to land, right? Like who, who to connect with more. Um, like, am I indigenous indigenous enough to identify as indigenous am i black enough to say you know that i'm african-american or am i mexican enough even if i don't speak spanish like all of these things and all of these realms coming together when it comes to birth i think that it's really important to realize that like all of these cultures with um, multicultural families um connect through spirituality and even though i can't speak the languages i'm still in touch with my ancestors in a way that they have impacted my ability to birth the way that I birth um, and to birth the way that others birth and also the traditions and hardships and um, you know different levels of giving and taking that has happened um, throughout our colonizations of our nations um, impact every individual that is connected through the bloodline of all of these cultural backgrounds and so I'm hopefully I'm saying something that's not too um, roundabout but what I'm basically trying to say is that what was important to me as an indigenous birther that also has the native and Mexican background as well as African American is that the spirituality that I had with all of the people that were present at all of my births made a huge difference um, in my ability to stay strong and my ability to trust um, in my ability to birth. And I feel like that's something that as a student midwife and a future midwife, I can bring into the space of all of those that I serve is to bring that spirituality and that support and that um, understanding of knowing that even though I may not know everything about my cultural background, I can still connect with you spiritually to make um, a strong enough impact to support and um, encourage you to connect with your ancestors in a way that's best for you. Um, so yeah. <laughs> can I respond to that? Uh, awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think when we're, like so many of our native people across the world have been facing, you know, I mean, obviously like the intermarriage and like the intercultural connection of so many different peoples coming together as a result of not just of like colonization in a negative fashion, but also just cultural mixing and, and you know, cross-cultural exchange throughout the world. Um, but particularly within indigenous context and in the context of particularly Western imperialism over the last 500 years, um, we, I think a lot of us come to these places of um, really struggling with identity, <laughs> in particular as Native folks, um, and that that, that, um, that struggle in itself is, um, is evidence of the success of colonial impositions on identity and who we, you know, that they get to decide who we are rather than we getting to decide who we are. Um, and so, so worried about how other people see us versus how our ancestors see us, right? And how, and how those things take precedence over the views of our ancestors, the views of our community, the views of our nation. Um, and that's really like, it's messed up, <laughs> um, you know, very, very bluntly. But, um, you know, I love the memes that are going around, um, you know, about language revitalization. But what I want to expand on is like, as a parent, you know, when your, your kid is really young, like, especially in that, like, one and a half to two and a half range and they're trying so hard to do that one like adult thing and their fingers just aren't coordinated enough to like pull it off quite and they don't quite have the language to express it but they're trying with that focus with that intensity that you know only a really tiny human can really have and the compassion and love that we feel for that child watching them struggle and still trying right, the dedication, the focus, the, the love that we feel for them as they're going through that, as much as me, we may want to, like, jump in and help them, right, that's, I, I do believe that's how our ancestors feel about us, right, is that they watch us struggling as best we can, and, and love us in spite of, and because of that focus, even if we're really clumsy at it, 
even if we don't have the coordination or the the words or the articulation or um, you know particularly speaking other languages it can be hard for us to hear the sounds of our own language it can be hard for us to hear the intonations and like glottal stops and the nasalized vowels and and all of those it can be difficult but when we try anyway when we try with that good heart when we bring everything we have to this situation be it parenting be it being a midwife being it you know whatever and really doing it with the intent of trying to bring our ancestors back into this contemporary um into this contemporary situation to like heal our collective conscious and move forward i believe that they support and love us for that um and honestly to heck with what anyone else thinks at that point thank you so much for that i, I also just want to add that in addition um that so many of us are going through our pregnancy journeys without um, a cultural midwife that can hold us and that often it can feel really fragmented and so the the idea of of us putting intention into moments um, is it's it's about each person on their own journey you know it's about each person um, trying to also just remember what they want to share with their, with their children. And so um, if that is, is clear to you and you know who to go to and you know who to ask and you know what foods those might be, um, you know, then, then that is, that's one person's way. But I also just wanna say for the people of us that are mixed heritage, for the people of us that are displaced, for the people of us that don't know where to even begin, um, that we can also, we can be doing that same work and it's going to still lead us there. And so we can still be thinking like, do I want it to be a food that I could have grown and nurtured and loved and that could be on this land that I'm on, um, you know, in this, in this soil right here, or is it going to be boxed cereal out of a box, um, you know, that, or, a, a form of agriculture that is is not in connection um, to my belief system. Like there's a, a lot of ways, whether they were our ancestral foods or not, because um, I understand that some people, um, you know, don't know where to begin with that journey. Um, but we all can begin with with putting out the invitation. And some of those ancestors, it was just, you know, Patricia is on this call, but it was just recently that, you know, she gave, she has a prayer um, that was shared in a book. And I was like, I can translate that. Like, I don't have a prayer um, for, I, I didn't, I wasn't given a prayer specifically to share with, with the babies in my tribe. But here is this beautiful one that is a beginning and I feel the love in it. And I can find the words and I can try and, and, and that the love and that intention, um, it, it wasn't something that was given to me in my language, but I can try and, and, you know, recreate this thing in, in the very best way I can. Um, and because it's done in such love and in this is, is with, with such a, um, intention behind it, um, I believe that you know, it, it'll, it will speak um, to the babies that I share it with in the, in the same, in, in as much of the way as I can. Uh, Patricia, would you like to share about that? I see you typing. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh my God, I love you all. It's so nice to see my daughters, <laughs> my spirit daughters. Uh, you, what I just typed, you mean? Yes. Yeah, you know, I think that um, I think it's important. Um, well, as you know, we've been on a journey, uh, some of us here on this call together, and um, I think that one thing that really struck me in sharing about birthing knowledge is that, um, and it goes back to um, what was said earlier, you know, about sometimes how um, we're, we're having to piece together the knowledge again. We're having to we um, connect to it <clears throat> but um i love one i remember uh, one teaching is that the knowledge didn't go away we just got disconnected from it and so the one way that we can connect to our knowledge is through prayer through ceremony 
And then that um, elders really do. I think over the course of my life, I've seen so many elders share teachings from people from other nations uh, or peoples because uh, they wanted to help them bring their knowledge back. And a lot of times, um, a lot of times when we have a song or a ceremony, even it's been a song that's been gifted from another people because there was some kind of relationship established. So they, they, they gifted the, so they, they honored the relationship. Sometimes they recognized it, created it, sealed it. It was like an accord sometimes even where they would share some dance or song or, or even a ceremony to uh, solidify that relationship with another a group of people. So I think there's so many ways that um, we need to think about um, ways that we can uh, help each other and support each other so that we can continue. Um, and so this is why then you'll see sometimes a dance when you don't have that animal in your in your original territory, but somebody brought that medicine from that animal to you all or to us because of those relationships. So I think those are examples for us to think about as we um, really work to bring back birth because we know how much has been um, dis you know, disconnected from us. Something that I've learned from one of my sisters here is that that shame of not being connected to our knowledge is not ours to carry. Um, and that has helped me, you know, let go of, you know, some of those feelings of, I mean, it's still really hard. It's still hard. Like there's so much more that I wish I knew and just trying to focus on, you know, moving forward and trying to help reconnect, you know, for our kids so that they have a little bit more than maybe like what I had growing up. Um, for example, like our names, um, I didn't grow up with a Danaka name and later on as we're, you know, my brother and sisters and I are learning more of our language, um, trying to remember our naming ceremonies um, and kind of piece that back together so that we can do that for our kids because we know that was so important for grounding our kids in who they are and where they come from and connecting to their ancestors. Um, and we may not have done it in the way that, you know, the last time it was done in our family. Um, but our, you know, cultures and traditions are, are always evolving um, with what's going on at the time. And so we piece it together, you know, as best as we could so that our kids could have that foundation. Hello, I'm Sgunit Diosta. I'm from Akwazasne. I am a Mohawk, Haudenosaunee, Gunit Gahaga. And I totally agree with what Margaret just said about that shame. I found personally that carrying that shame, I didn't realize it, right, until um, I'm three kids in and I'm like, oh my gosh, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm ashamed of not speaking my language. Like, I'm not, I'm not being a fluent speaker. And I work every day at it to, you know, label everything around the house. And if you know the word for it, then you speak it, right? Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't care how little it is, right? open the door, Apple, whatever, you, you use it. And um, my daughter, my oldest has become a really big stickler for that now, right? Like, well, you said Apple, you know what that is. Like, <laughs> so, so it's easy, I thought, like now to start pushing that, like that little agenda here to like use all those little words and um, that it isn't my shame to carry, right? That was a decision that my grandmother had made not to speak to her children. And, and then we just, it just, it's gone, right? Like. So, um, you know, there's so, so much great work being done by language revitalizers. So like, you know, you can, you can find these things on the internet now, which, you know, when I think 10 years ago, it was a little bit harder, but now there's so many things being done. So if you're looking, you're going to find it. And um, I just kind of wanted to throw that out about um, for, um, for in my culture and right, in Haudenosaunee people, we have uh, seed ceremonies that we sing when um, girls are born. So 
um, we sing when for seeds when we plant and that's a woman's job right to, to sing to the seeds and we tell them oh you're so beautiful like all of the words in our language is we're, we're building the, up those seeds right you're so amazing you're gonna make you know you're gonna grow beautiful and bountiful and um, and then that's it right they're in the ground right you planted your seeds and so when our when our women are, are birthing girls that's what you sing when they come and exactly um, like what Rhonda was saying, right? It doesn't have to be in, in, in your language and even in English, like that intention, that feeling is there and um, being able to give what, whatever you can give, right? And also that every one of those gifts, it was actually an Agwazazne youth that um, she said it so perfectly. And I, I was, um, in Akwesasne, we traveled over to the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives gathering in Nova Scotia. And she came along, her, her mother was one of the midwifery students there. And when we were in a circle and just having a conversation, we were talking about decolonization. We were talking about all these really hard concepts that were just heavy and sometimes we feel defeated. And, um, and she just looked at us and, and she just was telling us like, just, you know, anything you can do because all day long we're, we're being filled up with all of these other things, you know, that aren't our, aren't our cultural ways. And so, you know, yes, if, if it is the sound of the drum or it is, you know, the, a, a hello, um, that is one more gift that is one more towards uh, restoring and reclaiming ancestral ways. And so if it is one word, that is okay. And it is a place to begin. And so we need to stop holding ourselves back um, because we can't, you know, in the, so Autumn and Margaret and Patricia, we, we, we've, we've, um, we've been meeting together for several years now and, um, you know, I was like, oh, I can't introduce myself like some people can. And, you know, I don't know enough of the language. And then I was like, by just saying I can't do a long, fluid, fluent introduction, um, I'm holding back from just saying my name is. And, you know, here's where I come from. Um, and that it, it's had, it takes some intention and bravery and um, but it, it's not our shame to carry and also that our grandmothers and all of those people before us who, who, who tucked away and hid their drums, who stopped speaking to, it was to protect us and that we also, we, it's not our shame and it's also that by picking it back up now because it's safe, because we can, because you can learn Mohawk online, because there are these, these this this freedom and this ability to do that it also feels like um, that is part of the healing um, because we can in in so many ways do some things that just were not safe for my grandmother it was not safe and you know toby who's on the line here if um you know he always speaks so strongly about that and um you know about how you know we 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 pull the cedar and we do all of these things now um, because things were quiet for a while to protect us. And in that, in that now we, we have that ability to, to step in, in in as many ways as we can, um, in tiny ways, um, you know, or just, just think and dream, what is that flower that's coming to you? What is that, that, that creature that keeps visiting? You know, what is that sound or that instrument or, you know, any of those things that just bring you, bring you peace? Um, then we want to share those with our children. Um, kind of lesson for me along the way in trying to reconnect with ceremony is um, recognizing and, you know, trusting, you know, what we're feeling, you know, like I might've had like feelings before about something, but, you know, wasn't like trusting, you know, what it was, because it wasn't like, you know, really obvious and like super clear, but I would get like a subtle, you know, like feeling about things. Um, but I would kind of be like, oh, you know, just not trusting myself for knowing what that was. Um, so part of my learning and reconnecting with ceremony is kind of recognizing that feeling and trusting it. And, um, 
you know, believing it and, and in that way, like it gets stronger, like that feeling and that connection, you know, gets stronger. Um, so it was almost like kind of a, you know, choice that I had to make to, um, to trust, you know, what I was feeling. Um, I don't know if that makes sense for anybody else, but for me, you know, one of the learnings was that it's not always, it's not like a big boom for me, maybe for some people it is, um, but it's more like a subtle, you know, being there. And so that's been part of my learning is recognizing that and, and, and trusting myself. Margaret, are you um, interested in just sharing about um, the the food book and you know that conversation with the, or that moment that happened with your family? Um, I just feel like the with the introducing of of traditional foods and and uh, those conversations and and just kind of countering um, mainstream culture that it's just a really valuable story. Sure. Um, so we are living in Anchorage, um, and as we're raising our kids here, um, you know, I, I mentioned that our oldest is 10 years old and he's lived, you know, all of his life, most of his life, you know, here in Anchorage, um, for, you know, I've kind of grieved them not having the same growing up that I was able to have, you know, going to fish camp in the summers and being connected to our land in that way. Um, but so we, you know, do what we can to try to still connect with the land and, and you know, teach how to, how to fish and harvest and appreciate traditional foods. Um, and one way that that recently, like, came back to me or to us, my seven-year-old had picked up a book at the school library and he likes you know he likes he thought it was interesting because it was like disgusting foods um and he didn't look at it much more than that just like the title like the graphics of the you know the words were you know like neon colors and like sharp edges and it drew his attention and it was like disgusting foods and he was in the car um coming home and took out his book from the library and then his older brother sitting next to him, you know, asked him what that was. And um, so they started flipping through it. He hadn't like looked at it yet and they started flipping through it and they saw, um, you know, uh, muktuk, which is a, a, one of our traditional foods here in Alaska. And our 10 year old, you know, that's like one of his favorite foods. And so he was like, what, you know, dad, they have muktuk in here. Um, his dad was driving them home from school. And then they were looking some more and then they saw like a traditional Filipino food and you know, they're Filipino, their dad is Filipino. And so they're like, what, you know, like they were seeing like their foods in this book and, um, EJ, my partner, he was the one with them at that time, you know, could hear the hurt and confusion in their voice that they were seeing like their traditional foods listed in this book of like disgusting foods and just that message that they were confused by, like, why are their foods disgusting? <laughs> and um, so EJ, I don't, is this what you mean, the story, Rhonda? So EJ, um, you know, put it out there on social media, you know, something about this book. And um, somehow it got to the publisher and the publisher of that book um, responded like right away, like, oh, you know, we're pulling this from um, our line of books and, you know, like an apology for, you know, that that had happened. Um, so it was kind of a cool way that, you know, their response for taking that book out of print um, and, you know, their apology and, you know, recognizing why it was wrong. But um, it was kind of a, felt nice for us knowing that our, our kids are still loving and appreciating our traditional foods, even if, um, you know, we're living here in the city. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I feel like that's the part that felt really powerful to me is that um, piece of um, that they were they had that foundation that that their foods were important and that their foods were delicious and that their foods were a taste that does not need to be um, you know criticized and that you know but that happens like try it's kind of like you know, if someone has lived a life of, of white bread and white sugar, and then you're trying to feed them from that opposite direction, it's, it's really challenging. But giving these first moments as many times as we possibly can to our children will, will, will shape those later palates. It will shape those later conversations, that familiarity, that comfort. Um, and so that's part of why, even if the other pieces seep in, um, that we've we've begun from we've we've been able to begin and um, you know really have that be a foundation um, that is it can come and, and really instill pride as well. So Otto, um, Ron, I I kind of want to follow up with that too. Like this isn't obviously the topic of our of this mm -hmm. um, like this particular session, but I think it's an important first for us to acknowledge is that, and I'm sure we, we all have this, all the people who are on this call, I'm willing to bet could look back over the course of their memories and remember the first time, probably as a child, where they really understood their place in the colonial system, where they understood how they were seen as a native person by colonial society. If we all looked back, I'm sure we could all find that memory, right? Or a couple of them, right? And that that is a first that I'm, it, it's not the first that we're talking about today, but it's the, it's the first that I think it's important for us all to acknowledge and how we parent our children through those firsts and validate them. The valid, like what I loved about Margaret and EJ's story is the way they immediately validated their kids' experience about it. Like, you're right, that's messed up. <laughs> um, like, you're right, you should love those foods because you love them and no one has the right to tell you that they're disgusting, right? Um, and, you know, for me, like I, you know, I, I was privileged in that I was raised by indigenous academics, like decolonization, colonial theory, like all of that stuff. Like I, I grew up reading Albert Memory, like, um, but I still remember the first time where I really understood who I was in relation to them, you know, the capital T them. And I wish in some ways that I could insulate my son from having that first, but also I acknowledge the importance of that first time as well, because those times made me who I am and I'm grateful for them because it, it instilled in me a certain fighting spirit that I don't believe I would otherwise have. Um, and so how we parent our children through those moments of, through those more painful firsts, um, also has the ability to influence how they conduct themselves in the rest of their lives. Um, and so really, I think having, you know, coming from those places of empathy where we also understand um, the hurt um, and, the, and the feelings of indignity and the frustrations and the anger um, and, and the impotence sometimes of those moments um, and, and being empathetic to our kids as they, as they experience and, and midwife or doula or whatever your, your, choice of verbiage is, um, parent them through those experiences so that they come out on the other side feeling pride in who they are. Um, and yeah, first foods are a really good way to do that, right? How they're born is a really good way to do that. Telling them their birth stories, giving them their traditional food, telling them where they come from and who their people are and what their language is, those things are important um, because it gives them a foundation from which to push back and say, I am not less. Can I just say that for the people that this recording is um, going to be offered to that are currently pregnant and on their, on their journey, do you have any closing thoughts or, um, you know, any specific direction that you want to give to someone who right now is is on their on their way um, and if both Margaret and Autumn could just speak to that um, so that we can offer that 
guidance to the pregnant people. Go ahead, Margaret. All right, what did you ask us? <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted you to speak directly to someone who is beginning their pregnancy journey and, you know, just for some, you know, what would be the one thing that you would advise if someone was watching this recording and they were, you know, beginning this, you know, having these thoughts for the first time, you know, what would you, what guidance would you give? I don't know if I would like have advice or guidance. I just um, like when I'm meeting with people, ask, you know, questions that maybe might trigger like some of their remembering or learning. So at the beginning of pregnancy, asking, you know, um, you know, through kind of like, you know, talking about people's nutrition, um, I strongly support traditional foods, just kind of finding out like their connection to their foods and the land, um, their family. Um, if they, um, you know, I ask, you know, who they have in their community that they can go to or talk to, to ask about um, or to learn about pregnancy and getting ready for labor and birth. So I just tend to like ask questions, like finding out, you know, where, their connections are and try to grow, you know, encourage those. Um, for myself, like in my own um, pregnancy journey the first time, um, I found that um, I guess the way that I chose our midwife and connected with our midwife was she just felt really nurturing and mothering to me. Like I didn't know of any um, indigenous midwives here at that time. Um, but um, I didn't make, I didn't have my own mom, you know, to kind of be with me during that time. And so I recognized later on that the way that I chose my midwife is because she, she was kind of like nurturing and mothering to me. And, um, she would just, you know, ask me those, she wouldn't tell me what to do, um, but, you know, at every appointment or meeting that we had together, just kind of share, you know, information and ask us to like think deeper about all these things that we hadn't thought about before, you know, like our, our food and um, our sleep and, you know, how much water I was drinking, you know, just like kind of the basics, but um, um, thinking about, you know, what we're exposed to the, even like whatever I put on my skin, what kind of soaps and lotions I use and how that's, a, how we're, whatever I'm exposed to this little developing being inside of me is exposed to at a much, you know, bigger with a much bigger impact on them. And so that led me to like, just thinking about what I put on my body even, and what I'm putting into my body, like what kinds of foods. Um, and that's what led me to, you know, talking that healing journey that I was kind of mentioning before too, realizing that those cycles of, you know, trauma and stuff that I um, knew that like, I didn't want that to continue with my kids. And so I knew that had to stop, you know, within me, like right there. And so did whatever I could to kind of process those things. And, you know, that's a lifelong thing still happening, but that was kind of the beginning of that realization. Um, the way that a big learning through my pregnancies was realizing how stress affects me and affects my pregnancies. Um, I mentioned that my daughter, first daughter was born at 34 weeks. My water had broke with, you know, when I was pregnant with her at 31 weeks. And it was very clearly after like a peak of stress, just um, 
a bunch of stuff, you know, in my life at that time um, that kind of peaked. And then the next day, like that big dramatic gush of, you know, my water breaking happened. And, um, and then I was in the hospital from then on until she was born three weeks later. Um, so just finding out, you know, what ways people have for managing their stress and try to like grow from that. Um, yeah, and, and just kind of those questions I was mentioning before, like, what do you want um, your baby's first exposures to be, you know, prenatally and at birth, you know, and in, and through your parenting and what can you do to like help shape that and kind of reclaim that like power of, you know, You can go Adam. Autumn, you have not been unmuted that whole time. So oh, oh sorry. I totally pressed the unmute button. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, y'all. Um, I think first off, going back to the question that Margaret um, was talking about earlier, um, and just really um, a, as a good consciousness building exercise, you know, what are the first things you want your baby to hear? What are the first things you want your baby to taste? What do you? What are the first things you want your baby to feel? Um, what are the first songs you want your baby um, to, to be sung to them? Um, and you know, and also thinking about like, what do you want to do with your placenta? Right. Um, you know, talking about these really important things that we don't normally think about anymore because we're not we're not trained to. Right. We're not socialized to do those things. And so as a consciousness building exercise, even if only to find out what's important to you, um, I think that's a really good place to start in terms of, you know, making decisions and then advocating for yourself that these are the this is the way I'm going to bring my baby into this world and being strong in that, um, which can be hard for us. Um, like collectively as native people, it's really hard for us to like stand up the, the medical systems just because of the trauma that we faced under them. Um, but I think deeper than that, and I, I don't know if this is advice so much as an observation, um, but I work a lot, um, you know, primarily in my own community, I do, um, I don't do birth as much as I do coming of age ceremony. That's mostly what I do with, um, with, with my own community um, and with my own people. And one of the things I've realized working with a lot of these young um, young girls, girls becoming women, is that they're will they themselves are willing to put up with people treating them not very well. Um, they're they're okay with people not treating them well, but they will get all kind of worked up if something happens to their friend, if something happens to their sister, right? There's a protective instinct that comes over us when we look at other people from our community. I think that's really valid and valuable. Um, but I guess like a piece of advice would be to look at, you know, to, as you're, as you're pregnant, to look at your baby, um, to think about your baby and realize like how much love and compassion and, um, and excitement you have for this little being. And if you were to have anyone else holding that baby, how would you want them to treat that baby? How would you want to take care of them holding that baby? If your sister was pregnant, if your friend was pregnant, um, um, if a family member or other relative was pregnant, how would you want them holding that baby inside of them? And how would you want them treated? And once you decide that, because I'm willing to bet that standard would be pretty high for most of us, think about that for yourself, right? Realize that you are the person carrying that baby and you deserve to be treated as much as well as you would hope that sister, that friend, that relative to be treated, right? So if you don't want them being pushed around, you shouldn't tolerate that either, right? If you don't, if you want their choices and decisions and, and wishes for their baby to be heard and loved and respected, you should be, you, you are deserving of having that same expectation for your choices and desires, right, moving forward. Um, and if you 
like if you would want your niece or nephew or cousin or you know whatever baby to have a name um have a song to have moccasins to have a cradle board <laughs> to have any of those things your baby is just as deserving of them um and to go for it um you know very very dramatically i guess we have nothing to lose but our chains in this regard um you you have nothing to lose by pursuing the things that are going to make you and your baby happy um, and particularly with, you know, the craziness of the world as it currently exists and the craziness of the world as it's always existed for Indigenous people, we have the right to be happy and love and care for. Um, and so to have that empathy and compassion for yourself as well as the empathy and compassion for your baby as well. How would you want to be born? Thank you so, so much to both of the speakers and uh, to the guests and also to all the people who wrote in your responses and offered some of your stories. Um, I would like to just end with um, my dear friend who I asked if he could um, do a closing for us. And so if Toby, if you would be, I wanted to unmute yourself and then I will end the recording and I hope uh, that all of you can join us again um, for future episodes. Mostly want to say thank you. Haichka, CM, honorable people. The words that you share, they elevate those firsts in our community that are our young people, and in some cases, even our adults that are birthing children's first experience at reconnecting with culture. And so these firsts become powerful in navigating what I heard was those traumas that we all have memory of, whether that memory is recent or historical. We've had some of our greatest role models removed from our communities. Of words that I would close with, I would ask this, creator, please watch over every single one of these people. Help them to be those places where the light starts, where those firsts begin. Help them to help others. I would wanna share these words because I'm thinking of my own daughter and my wife at this time. I have watched as they have created firsts in our family again, that specifically my daughter Mildred who named three of her boys indigenous names that I have grandsons that for the first time again in our family, we have children with names like Lasak Yakola, Soaring Eagle, or Shidzabish, which means stealthy warrior or squideatud, someone blessed with life. I'm appreciative of hearing because it's important that children hear those first words and that they be good words. I wanna share and I'll close with this song because it's a song dear to me that comes from my father who one of his firsts with language was being corrected that what he thought he was saying was as much as something can be, I love you. And it turned out what he was actually saying as much as something can be, I'm just kidding. Once he learned how to say it correctly, it became a thing of strength in our home to hear him sing to my mother. And so I will close with those words. As much as something can be, I love you. Thank you for your hard work and your work at creating first for our next generation, IHKCM.